think about it. Who is the one man who has the experience and the qualifications to lead America in these troubled, dangerous times? Nixon's the one. He was under attack constantly. And, and the, the liberal media and the liberal elite were constantly after him. And uh, when, when, I, when I say liberal elite, or I talk Ivy League, I'm not talking about some young man or woman that's going to Princeton or Yale or Harvard or something like that. I'm talking about attitude an attitude of superiority, and Nixon hated that. Hello, and welcome to Washington Post Live. I'm Dan Baltz, Chief Correspondent here at The Post. We're continuing our examination of the 50th anniversary of the Watergate break-in today uh, with two men who were top aides to President Nixon. Uh, Dwight Chapin began working for him before he was elected president and served as deputy assistant to the president from 1969 to 1973. Ken Kachigian was a speechwriter for the president and later worked for the president in the post-presidential years. Gentlemen, welcome. Thank you very much for being with us today. Before we get to Watergate, I want to start by asking both of you a little bit about President Nixon himself. Uh, Dwight Chapin, what kind of man was Nixon? What kind of president was Nixon? Uh, Nixon was a introvert in an extrovert's business. Uh, he was incredibly bright. He was a hard worker. Uh, he had, his work ethic was unbelievable. He was a patriot and he believed deeply in America. He did everything in his power to conduct his presidency in a way that would help the American people and that would bring about peace in the world. So he was, he was in my estimation, uh, an incredible uh, president and a man of great distinction. Ken, how would you answer that? And, and uh, how would you assess both his strengths and his weaknesses uh, as a politician and as a president? Well, he was, uh, Danny was fascinating. Uh, sitting with him for hours and hours here in San Clemente after his presidency, um, to, to hear him talk about, uh, he didn't talk about uh, normal people like you and I did. He talked about Winston Churchill and, and, uh, and, and Nehru and uh, Khrushchev and, and all the great leaders of the world, uh, Dwight Eisenhower. And he dropped those names like you and I would uh, talk about our neighbors. And so there was an enormous fascination in learning about Amer American history and world history with him. So he had just enormous knowledge of, of and, and he was had a great uh, grasp of history. And uh, like Dwight said, he was, uh, an extremely hard worker. So uh, that was his great strength uh, th that he brought to the world stage, all that background and history that uh, helped him do those enormous in negotiations that he did with the strategic arms talks and anti-ballistic missile treaties that he did. Uh, and that was his strength. Uh, I'd say his, what weakness he had was Probably, like Dwight said, he, he was an introvert uh, and he uh, he preferred time alone a lot of uh, a lot of it. He didn't like to get out. Uh, you know, his main hobby was just working. So um, I I I don't know that uh, I'd, I I didn't see all those weaknesses in him that people talked about. His uh, I saw a lot of things in him that people didn't see, like, you know, 
one thing I just I remember about him that that uh, people sh don't know about him it was uh, a soft side to him. Uh, when Hubert Humphrey was dying back in 1978, uh, I was with him when he placed calls to Hubert Humphrey, and um, and he the two great warriors were talking with each other in in, in a sense that uh, this warmth passing between them it was just extraordinary, Dan. You couldn't believe it. Ken, how would you compare him with the with the man who you helped elect and work for in 1980, Ronald Reagan? What compare <laughs> there, Nixon and Reagan? There are two wholly different people. Uh, uh, Nixon loved politics. He loved the rough and tumble of politics. He loved the back and forth. Uh, he loved the 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 the, the minutia of politics. Whereas uh, Reagan. Uh, Reagan was a hard worker, but uh, Reagan uh, would prefer time at the ranch and cutting wood and and when his time off. But uh, Nixon would love to go to Camp David and and study about the next campaign or or study about uh, uh, you know uh, uh, politics and and th they were just wholly d different ways of looking at each other. Uh, uh, when Reagan was running for uh, President Nixon would call me and give me ideas about how Reagan could run the campaign. I don't think Reagan ever thought about the minutia of politics of, or about uh, when he was out of office of calling other political figures and giving them advice. Uh, but still, they they were both competitive, actually. Reagan was more competitive than people think. And um, there was a side to Reagan that the people didn't know about how he could be hard hitting that people never knew, and but uh, they they were so different in the sense that uh, N Nixon uh, had a grasp of, of world politics that Reagan didn't have, but Reagan still had a big pic uh, uh, a big picture look at domestic politics that that Nixon was not interested in. Yeah. Um you know, when you think about 1972, you could divide it into two parts, uh, the early part of 1972, and then, then once the break-in occurred, the, the rest of the year. Dwight, um, that first part of 1972 was historic. There was the opening to China, um, and then there was the later trip to the Soviet Union and three other countries and the dramatic return with Nixon landing on the Capitol grounds and going into the uh, House chamber to address the, uh, the, the, the American people. Um, Give me a sense of kind of where you all were at that point uh, in early June of 1972, given what you had done in the first number of months. Was there was there a sense of celebration, um, but also a certain kind of you know concern or even paranoia about the upcoming election? I, I don't think so. I, I don't remember any paranoia about the upcoming election. We were on a uh, a high. I mean, the president had, had that incredible journey to the opening of China. And then, as you say, the uh, signing of the SALT agreements in Moscow. And it was the, I, I, I personally thought I had seen kind of a transition from being president to his being world statesman. I mean, the, these journeys were not only focused on by America and by the American media, but you know, around the world, he, he was taking on a certain aura uh, that just, uh, it was uh, it was a real high. And, and when he went into the Congress that night that we got back from uh, the Moscow trip and the helicopter landed at the Capitol, I mean, it was a thunderous ovation in there. And as you say, it's, it's almost, it is kind of a line of demarcation in the, from the fact that, uh, Watergate happened just a few weeks later. Uh, but I, I would say that it did not really impact us until well past the convention, until we got into the October period. I mean, he, he rode that high all the way to Miami for the Republican convention in August. And then, of course, as you know, he had this incredible landslide, 18 million votes carried every every state except Massachusetts and the District of Columbia. So, I mean, the the power of the apex that he had uh, risen to 
stayed with him right on through the election. And then it was the post-election uh, when it really started uh, getting messy. Ken, um, I think you were at the campaign for a, a part of that period. Um, what was the sense inside the campaign? I mean, we know now from, you know, from everything that came out in Watergate uh, that there was certainly an effort to, to uh, you know, to damage Democratic opponents. Um, so what was going on in the campaign and how were you all assessing uh, things? Uh, you're talking about the 72 campaign? Yeah, the 72 campaign. Well, uh, originally, obviously, we thought Muskie was the biggest threat. And um, uh, we did, we made every effort <laughs> initially to to weaken Muskie. And uh, we, um, within the campaign, we we thought that Muskie was going to be the, 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 the big strength in the campaign. Of course, he faltered early in, in New Hampshire. And then uh, McGovern had this great support among the liberals in, in the party. And there was a great insurgency. And then uh, McGovern emerged. And uh, but he turned out. And could, to, I, could, I, could, I, could I just interrupt for just one, one note? I mean, he faltered in part because of the Canuck letter that, that had been written by Ken Clausen, who was in the White House communications office. Did you all know? Did, did you all know anything about that? Well, Clausen, I, Clausen claimed to have written it, but he actually did not, Dan. He, he, he first claimed to have written it. I think he was trying to impress uh, Marilyn Berger, one of your colleagues at the Washington Post. But he, he, he later reneged and say that he didn't. And despite all the efforts they made to try to pin it on the White House, uh, uh, the special prosecutors were never able to pin that on anybody, actually. So nobody was ever charged from the Nixon uh, side of the campaign uh, with, with writing the Canuck letter. So uh, uh, that's one of the great mysteries of Watergate that nobody ever figured out who wrote the Canuck letter. But uh, who knows where it came from? Maybe it was written by Bill Lowe, who knows? But uh, anyway, uh, Muskie faltered and McGovern emerged. But I, I don't think we really thought there was any big uh, threats. It was just going to be a hard, hard bitten campaign. And you have to remember that uh, what you haven't mentioned was Vietnam was uh, looming over us the entire time. And what Dwight didn't mention is, is that even after this triumphal return uh, uh, from China in, in June and, and all the summits and everything else, we still had the, the Vietnam War and trying to get these peace talks going. And that was a constant, constant effort from the beginning of the Nixon presidency until the peace talks ended. Yeah. Uh, let's, let's move now to the moment of the break-in. Uh, Dwight, you've written about where you were when you first were informed about this or first heard about it, uh, tell our viewers what that moment was like. You were on the Eastern shore uh, that weekend and you got, a, you got a call that, or you were told you needed to call the White House. Talk about what happened, but particularly talk about your reaction to it, what you thought about it at that point. Right, well, uh, it was ironic because we had just gotten back from Moscow and this uh, Sheila Griffin, who was, uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Smith, he was the arms control director, Gerard Smith. It was his daughter's 30th birthday and we were there for the uh, celebration. And I got back to the inn late at night. Uh, it was around two in the morning and there was this message to call Bob Haldeman immediately. Uh, I called Bob and he asked me, he said, do, uh, do, do you know anything about a plan to break into Democrat headquarters at the Watergate? I, and I said, no, no. And he says, you've heard nothing about any plan at all? I said, I, I know nothing about it. Uh, and he said, okay, thank you and good night. That was an incredibly important call because had Haldeman known previously about the break-in in May or any of the details, he would not have been calling me. He would have been calling Gordon Strawn, his aide who was in charge of liaison between John Dean and uh, Jeb Magruder at the campaign. And so uh, it, it served as evidence to me, as I thought about it later on, that Bob had absolutely no knowledge. He was trying to find out what had happened and whether any White House people were involved. 
Ken, did you think it was a third-rate burglary as it was described at the time, or did your your political instincts say to you this 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 is something I need to or we all need to pay it more attention to? Well, it it it, it concerned me a little bit. Uh, I heard about it uh, Saturday afternoon. Uh, I can't remember uh, who at the campaign called me. Uh, I was at home and uh, some somebody at the uh, campaign called. I, I honestly can't remember who it was, but uh, called me. And then I called uh, Pat Buchanan that night. He was at a social event, and 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 Pat, <laughs> Pat remembers it. He said it was like somebody. Uh, he, I, I had the tone in my voice that somebody died. <laughs> and uh, but uh, it uh, yeah, there was a concern that it 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 might have been some something that could have been connected to our campaign or not, but uh, who, but who knew? It was, um, we didn't know about it until uh, the days unfolded and, and uh, word started to come out that uh, there may have been some connection to the campaign. And of course, then uh, I did have some concerns. Yeah. Uh, I, I think I, it's important, Dan, uh, uh, could yeah, I just that from the very outset, I think in that one of the first calls that the president made to uh, Bob Haldeman, the chief of staff, was uh, the question of, was there anybody at the White House involved? And the answer was an emphatic no. Uh, there, there was no one at the White House involved as far as Bob Haldeman knew and as far as the president knew. And, and we now know from the documents that are present, and I, I cover this very clearly in my book, uh, we know that John Dean met with Gordon Liddy on the Monday after the break-in. Uh, John Dean asked Liddy who else at the White House knew. Liddy knew that Dean knew. And at that time, uh, Gordon Liddy informs Dean that Gordon Strawn knew, and Gordon Strawn being an aide to Haldeman. Those were the only two people in the White House that we know historically knew about the break. They may not have known exactly the day it was going to happen, but they knew about the plan of a break-in. And that, that's hugely important because neither one of those men come forward and tell either Nixon, Haldeman, or Ehrlichman. So they, they kept them in the dark, and they were the only two that knew. Um, Dwight. You talked about the high that everybody was on that carried on through the 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 election victory. Um, you went off for a long vacation after that to Ireland, as I recall. Uh, and yeah. you came back and you were told by Haldeman, your boss and your mentor, um, that you had to leave the White House. Um, right. What was your rea what was your reaction at that moment? Yeah, but, you said you had had no knowledge of the break in in advance, and yet you were you were going to have to take some of the fall. Yes, it was horrible. Uh, it, in fact, the story is worse than what you described because I had arrived back at the uh, White House on a Sunday, and the minute I got to the, my desk at the White House, I went in to check my mail. The phone rang, and it was John Dean, and he asked if he could drop by the next morning. He came in Monday morning around eight o'clock. We poured a cup of coffee. He looked at me. We talked a little bit about Ireland. And then he said, have you given any thought to what you're going to do? And that was my first clue. And I, I threw him out of my office. I picked up the phone and I called Bob Haldeman. And then I went up to Camp David and met with Bob Haldeman the next day. He, he, he was uh, very uh, so busy he couldn't see me that first day. So I went up there on Tuesday, and that's when I was told that I was going to have to leave. And the answer to your question, Dan, is I was heartbroken. I was crushed. I couldn't believe it. Uh, Bob told me at the time that the, uh, this man, Sam Irvin, may hold hearings, Senator Irvin, and therefore I was going to have to go, and uh, Chuck Colson was going to have to go, and Richard Kleindienst, the attorney general, was going to have to go. Uh, I remember distinctly walking into the men's room there at the uh, uh, up at Camp David, and uh, Dick Kleindienst, the attorney general of the United States, was there, 
bawling like a baby. I mean, he was crushed also. He had just met with Ehrlichman. So <clears throat> it was a very poignant moment when we had to go to Camp David and when we had to be kind of thrown overboard, thinking that by getting rid of the three of us, it might stem this thing from Irvin going ahead with the hearings. It was insane. Uh, I, I mean, I wrote a letter to Haldeman uh, saying, you know, are you sure you want to go at that? Nobody is going to believe uh, that getting rid of me, Dwight, uh, Dwight uh, that this is going to solve this problem. Uh, but obviously that was their strategy and it didn't work. <laughs> it sure didn't. Um, <laughs> on uh, At the end of April, uh, it was announced that uh, Haldeman and Ehrlichman uh, were resigning, that Dean was being fired. Uh, let's listen to what President Nixon said that night when he addressed the nation about the scandal. Today, in one of the most difficult decisions of my presidency, I accepted the resignations of two of my closest associates in the White House, Bob Haldeman, John Ehrlichman, two of the finest public servants it has been my privilege to know. Within a couple of uh, months after that, the story took another dramatic turn, and this was when Alexander Butterfield revealed uh, to the Irvin Committee the existence of the taping system uh, in, the, in the White House. Let's listen to what he said, and then I have some questions for both of you. Mr. Butterfield, are you aware of the installation of any listening devices in the Oval Office of the President? I was aware of listening devices. Yes, sir. When were those devices placed in the Oval Office? Approximately the summer of 1970. I cannot begin to recall the precise date. My guess, Mr. Thompson, is that the installation was made between, and this is a very rough guess, April or May of 1970 and perhaps the end of the summer or early fall 1970. Dwight, I, I'm assuming you did not know about the existence of the taping system. Um, when you heard that that existed, did you think at that point that President Nixon himself was now in real jeopardy uh, through the investigation? I, I was stunned. I had no idea, Dan, that the taping mechanism was in place. Uh, the people that knew that, it was a very small uh, group of people. Uh, I immediately thought this is going to be interesting. I, I, I did not know what, uh, what, what would come of it. Uh, I will say this, and I cover this in my book, the tapes are going to end up perhaps being a blessing as time goes on, because the tapes, as we get into more and more of them, uh, are, are, are starting to give, provide us material that is exculpatory for President Nixon. I mean, there, the, what, what happened in, with the prosecutors and when these tapes were put out, that they did these slices of the tapes, uh, all of which shows the abuse of power and, and, uh, and so forth, but they don't show the complete story of what was going on within the presidency and how some of the comments fit into context. So uh, I think there's a lot of road to travel here. Uh, we're 50 years into it, but we're a long way from getting to all of the, the bottom uh, level of what this thing was all about. Ken, you were in the White House at that point. Um, how, how much of a bombshell was this to all of you inside? And, and what did you do in terms of thinking about what do we do now in terms of mounting a defense, in terms of our messaging and our public communication, knowing that the investigators are, you know, are you know, swooping down on you? Well, it, as Dwight said, it was quite a shock. No, nobody knew about the taping system, and uh, there, was, there was no way to form a communication strategy until we knew what was on the tapes. And we didn't know what was on the tapes until uh, we started transcribing them. And uh, in some cases, they, they were uh, provided some difficulties, and then in other cases, they were exonerating. And uh, unfortunately, uh, Later on, uh, we had one tape that was called the smoking gun tape that uh, uh, forced the 
the president to uh, move along on his resignation. And if we knew then what we knew now that the smoking gun tape was actually a water pistol, it, that uh, it, it didn't turn out to be what it was, uh, uh, what everybody thought it was to be, that it, it didn't have the liability to the president that, that we all thought it was then, um, we, we would have mounted a di much different defense. But, at the, but when, it, when the tapes came out, we, we had no idea what kind of defense to mount, uh, Dan, because we didn't know what was on them. Uh, Dwight, you um, you were the first to go on trial. You were convicted of lying to the grand jury, and you served nine months in prison. Um, and you, I think you've indicated that you knew that Nixon was prepared to, quote unquote, discard people uh, for political purposes. Uh, could you talk about the price of loyalty to this president? Um, it came at a significant price for you and, and your family, and I wonder if you could reflect on that a minute. Well, I, I do say, Dan, in, in my book that, uh, you know, all the great privileges I was given and the, uh, the service to the nation, being able to participate, it was absolutely uh, phenomenal, and I am so grateful. Uh, the only thing I wish is that it didn't have a price tag called Watergate. I, I have remained loyal to President Nixon. I understand that if you're going to be uh, playing in that league, so to speak, that you've got to take the lumps along with uh, the good things that come along. I had made a mistake. I did not, in my opinion, uh, lie to the grand jury. I know what the intent was in my heart. Uh, I know uh, my whole attitude was to be truthful and forthright with the FBI and uh, in, in my grand jury hearings. But uh, the documents and my fellow citizens felt, felt that uh, I had uh, committed making false and misleading statements and I paid the price. Uh, the price was hard. Uh, going to prison was uh, incredibly difficult, but something that uh, one can overcome. I think, if nothing else, my story proves that, that you can bounce back off, off of these things. But it, it was a difficult period for me, and uh, uh, I, I put it into the, to the perspective this way. Uh, Eddie Carlson, who was the chairman of uh, United Airlines, where I had been working before I had to leave uh, to take care of this legal obligation, he said, Dwight, you've got to understand you're a political football. President Nixon, uh, toward uh, the end of his uh, life, uh, talked about Watergate being his last campaign. He knew it was all political. He, he did not act in a criminal way. And he viewed it as a political event. I viewed it always as a political event. I never viewed myself as a criminal or having uh, done criminal activities. This, this was the uh, Democratic Party, uh, particularly the Kennedy wing of the party. Uh, it was the uh, media, as I described in the clip that you showed at the start of the show. Uh, this was uh, an effort to bring down Richard Nixon. Did he help make that happen? He sure did. I mean, there's no question about that. Foolish mistakes were made. But at the, bo the bottom line, the denominator on this is that it was a political event. Well, it was a political event, but it was also uh, a, a series of actions, uh, a, a number of them illegal, uh, that we know that took place. But Ken, I want to I want to ask you the last question, and that is, uh, Richard Nixon was a smart politician, and as you both have described, a very smart man. Um, but in one way or another, his instincts let him down in the Watergate scandal. What happened? What happened to Nixon? Uh, that he misplayed it in the ways that he did. Well, he he made the mistake he's, uh, of of not getting in, in in front of it to begin with. Dan, uh, he he said uh, after the presidency that uh, he he needed to get out front right away, and that uh, he didn't do that, and so uh, he, mis he he misled himself. 
uh, at the outset, and he didn't get out in front right away, and that was his, that was his real mistake. And um, so he, he paid the price for it. But uh, afterwards, uh, you know, he, he brought back, he, he restored his life after the, the presidency. I give him credit for that. And, you know, he, he gave back to the, to the country and to the world. He wrote eight best-selling books after he left the presidency. He advised uh, uh, other presidents. He advised President Reagan. He advised him in his uh, two presidential campaigns. He advised President Clinton. And, uh, you know, he, he's, I think the world would be better off if he was around today advising President Biden, very frankly. All right. Well, uh, he did have a very active post-presidency, and uh, but obviously Watergate is the uh, the thing that many people or most will remember him for. Uh, gentlemen, unfortunately, we are out of time. Um, I'm sorry to say there's a lot more we uh, we could have covered in the in the time we had. Um, but thank you, Dwight Chapin, and thank you, Ken Kachigian, for being with us today. You bet. Good to see you. Thank you. Good to see you. Uh, and thanks to all of you who have been watching. Uh, we very much appreciate your being with us today. To check out um, future interviews, go to uh, WashingtonPostLive.com uh, and register, find out more information about our upcoming programs. Again, I'm Dan Baltz with the Washington Post. Thanks again for being with us.